I recommend you watch the first episode of The Idol, Pop Tarts and Rat Tales, and then analyze it with me here. The first episode of The Idol starts with a face close up of Jocelyn and her amazing acting, and ends with her head covered in red cloth with a pulsating hole in the mouth area as she breathes. The question is not, how did we get there? But, why did we get there at all? Let's go through the episode and figure it out together. This one is not about how Rolling Stone called the show, a torture porn, but about how ugly female pop star over-sexualization can get. I really think the show perfectly depicts it. Jocelyn, a protagonist, is a famous pop star that is going through a rebranding. The show doesn't give us any insight on how she used to be before it, hopefully just yet, but we know she has been through some serious traumatic experience of losing her mother and hasn't released music since. Jocelyn is in the middle of the photo shoot for her upcoming album cover, wearing nothing but silk robe and, well, a hospital wristband. A wristband because her record label executive Nikki Katz is trying to capitalize on Jocelyn's mental health, saying, mental illness is sexy. Nikki is a disgusting representative of Gen X, the so-called invisible generation, that coped with the abuse by laughing it off and telling the story at parties now trying to normalize it and act as if it wasn't a big deal. Here is Jocelyn all alone and motherless, working full frontal in the ruins and castoffs of Gen X toxic culture. Jocelyn is sexualized and slut-shamed on the internet as well. She is about to find out a selfie with a semen on her face is number one trending on Twitter. Meanwhile she is rehearsing a heavily erotic dance, that is ironically portrayed as the homage to Britney, as they both went through some traumatic experiences and press has been brutal. In reality, Jocelyn's rebranding is a reference to Spears' overly sexual blackout era in 2007, which was released while the singer was having public struggles with her mental well-being. Insincere and indifferent, the Gen X industry insiders literally look down at mentally struggling pop star and see only a product. That's when the show starts getting a little bit tricky. The intimacy coordinator scene. The guy that attempts to maintain the parameters of the nudity writer is portrayed as an annoying anti-feminist trying to stop Jocelyn from doing whatever she wants to to her own body. It is my boob, she exclaims, assuring the decision is hers and nobody is pressuring her into nudity. So these annoying rules and contracts are set to interrupt the true freedom and empowering of women? That's how the point of the scene came out, at least to me. But as much Jocelyn insists she is in control, it's clear she is not. Extremely vulnerable and mentally unstable, as they say on the verge of psychotic breakdown, pop star is using sex as a coping mechanism to her trauma, while her team is trying to make money out of it. Of course they want her areola out visible, and the monitor meant to make sure that celebrities are safe and protected when asked to do nudity or perform sex scenes is portrayed as a villain here. Not cool. A Vanity Fair journalist Talia seems to be the only one genuinely concerned about the leaked photo, saying Jocelyn is clearly a victim here. While deciding how to handle the leaked photo situation, her team is deciding to spin the narrative into one of victimization or empowerment. In their mind, and perhaps the mind of the show, these two often become the same thing. Tomorrow, I want to wake up to, like, 150 Google alerts telling me Jocelyn's some kind of feminist hero, right? Says Nikki, manager of Jocelyn's label. But I'm gonna start with, victim, and move up from there. Start with the victim, how? Like, isn't she a victim? When Talia is suggesting getting even with the guy who leaked the photo would inspire girls who are targeted and humiliated, Jocelyn questions whether revenge is empowering. Maybe it's nothing, but I feel that subconsciously it may affect the watcher into thinking that keeping quiet is better than standing up for themselves. Jocelyn is in the vulnerable position, it has been said. While watching, Basic Instinct, she opens up to her best friend, assistant that she is afraid of failure and humiliation, and that she is not sure about her upcoming track, World Class Sinner. Jocelyn is also mesmerized by the club owner, a very problematic Tedros. How and why she falls for someone who flirts with lines like, 
you fit perfectly in my arms, has a rat tail and quite low culture capital is unknown. One of the problems here is the weird rape fantasy storyline. He's so rapey. Yeah, I kind of like that about him. Is that how Sam Levinson thinks women are? Secretly into guys that look like they could rape them? Is it just me or is the, she was asking for it, narrative just one small step away? Honestly, that's disturbing. The second problem is how Tedros is portrayed as the ultimate male savior that changes how Jocelyn thinks about pop music with one Trojan horse metaphor. She even brings him to her home studio and lets him listen to her world-class sinner, after which he figures out instantly what was wrong with the track all this time. You gotta stop caring what people think. He gives very original advice. What a savior. Does it mean that her artistic release can arrive only when she's in the clenched fists of a man like Tedros? Now you can sing, he says after cutting the hole in the cloth that is wrapped around her face. If in the beginning of the episode we could argue whether Jocelyn was in a power position or not, she is clearly dominated here. Is this about a pop star's liberation or her subjugation? The rat tail guy ends up to be the one in control. While the plot is shallow and questionable, the execution is the clear representation of the so-called male gaze. Male gaze is defined as the act of depicting women and the world in the visual arts from a masculine, heterosexual perspective that presents women as sexual objects for the pleasure of the heterosexual male viewer. Jocelyn is sexualized in every scene. She sleeps topless and even wakes up sexy. The way she poses for her upcoming album cover, the way she lies in her bed naked, or even is reaching for the morning coffee. The episode is filled with abuse and explicit imagery. So is the terminology that is intentionally crude. It's excess for excess's sake that is expected to shock us, but most of the time it's WFT versus OMG. It's shocking in places and a little gross in others, but the strongest feeling is a sense of emptiness. Does it mean I won't watch the next episodes? No, I definitely will, out of the curiosity of where Levinson is going with this. How bad can it get?